Oral therapies generally involve using pills rather than IV chemotherapy or IV antibody therapy. Uh, many patients prefer to take pills because they can take them at home. And recently there have been a number of new pills or oral therapies that have been approved for the use of various lymphomas. So lenalidomide is a pill that was approved for the treatment of mantle cell lymphoma in the relapse setting. And idelalisib is a pill that was approved for the treatment of follicular lymphoma. In addition, there's a drug called abrutinib that's been approved for CLL. And all of these drugs that I mentioned may be used for other forms of lymphoma as well. For example, recently abrutinib was approved for the use in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So chemotherapy traditionally has uh, had a sense that it's not targeted treatment, meaning that it's rather nonspecific in the way it works. That's why a lot of the side effects can occur. Some of the oral agents are quite specific. Uh, for example, idelalisib is designed to hit a specific protein in the cell called PI3 kinase. And this protein is important in sustaining the lymphoma cells to stay alive. So by inhibiting that protein, it kind of puts the brakes on the lymphoma. Uh, other oral agents may be somewhat less specific. For example, lenalidomide, although there's a clear mechanism of action, there are a lot of things that it does to both the cells as well as other immune cells that might contribute to its uh, way of working. I think that there's a perception that oral therapies have less side effects, and to some degree that's true as compared to intravenous traditional chemotherapy agents. However, many oral therapies need to be taken for a very prolonged period of time. For example, the medications that I mentioned, lenalidomide and idelalisib, are often given as long as they keep working. Generally, chemotherapy is given for a defined period of time and then stopped. So I would say that they're different, um, not necessarily better or worse. And a lot of studies now are looking to try to incorporate these oral agents into traditional chemotherapy platforms. As an oncologist, I think it's a new world for us to be using a lot of oral agents. Um, we generally are used to seeing patients on a day that they're scheduled to get chemotherapy, uh, evaluate the patient, make sure they're safe to get the chemotherapy, and then give the chemotherapy. And then they come back and we see them again. With oral agents, they're taking them every day at home and we're obviously not evaluating them every day. So we have to figure out the optimal intervals to evaluate patients, ensure that we're following blood counts carefully because of some side effects that can occur, ensure that there's compliance and that there's a good dialogue on what patients should expect, and be able to rapidly deal with questions that patients have at home while they're taking these agents. I think adherence in general is important to get the maximal benefit from a treatment. For many of these agents, we haven't really prospectively evaluated the optimal duration of treatment. So as I was saying, frequently patients take these treatments for a long period of time. Uh, there have been observations where if you start and stop treatments too often, that could engender resistance, similar to what you might think of with antibiotics. So for those reasons, I think it's important that the physician team, and it often includes a nurse and a pharmacist, along with the patient, really have a careful dialogue about if the medication is going to be stopped or missed, what to do. There are many oral therapies under investigation for lymphoma, and I think what we're starting to see is that Soon more patients will be getting oral therapy than conventional IV therapy in lymphoma clinics. We're already starting to see that probably close to half of our patients are on some oral therapy. I think some particularly exciting oral therapies include a medication called Venetoclax, which is a medication that um, seems to work very well in various forms of lymphoma. There are also 
um, new compounds that are designed to inhibit some of the same proteins that are covered by idelalisib and abrutinib, but perhaps add some additional activities to try to make them work better. Not surprisingly in oncology, um, we're learning that with these oral therapies being as active as they are, that they may be even more active in combinations. And the first set of studies really tried to combine them with antibodies like rituximab, which is often combined with all kinds of treatments for lymphoma. Two recent studies, I think, are good examples of this. Uh, with lenalidomide, uh, the combination of lenalidomide and rituximab clearly seems better than lenalidomide alone in follicular lymphoma. And with idelalisib, uh, one of the approvals is in combination with rituximab, particularly in the setting of CLL. Uh, now, with that data in hand, many investigators are looking to combine these drugs with chemotherapy. And there are studies going on looking at, for example, venetoclax in combination with CHOP chemotherapy to see if that might be better than CHOP chemotherapy alone. There are many studies that have combined these novel agents with uh, bendamustine as well. And finally, the oral agents are being studied in a maintenance uh, fashion. So for example, in our cooperative group system, we're giving standard chemotherapy up front for patients with mantle cell lymphoma, and then studying whether in a period of lenalidomide maintenance after the chemotherapy might help prolong remissions in that setting. So many of these oral therapies are quite expensive. Uh, some of that uh, cost uh, might be disproportionately bared by patients compared to IV chemotherapy, largely due to um, our healthcare system in that uh, many people's prescription drug coverage is different from their drug coverage for IV treatments, particularly if they're given in the hospital. I will say that, um, at least in my institution, if we decide that we want to give an oral therapy to a patient, we've always been able to get that patient the oral therapy, whether it be through a special compassionate use program that the sponsors may have, or through charity care types of mechanisms. But I think as a society, uh, with these expensive oral agents, we are going to have to begin to confront how we're going to pay for this, and I know there's a greater dialogue going on about that in many circles. I think the, the goal with these oral therapies ultimately is going to be to use them in a precision way. And I think for diseases like follicular lymphoma, uh, we're going to soon get away from treating everybody with follicular lymphoma with bendamustine and rituximab. And then when they relapse, giving everybody something like idelalisib to move to a setting where we're going to understand subsets of patients that may have particular reasons to get lenalidomide or idelalisib or standard chemoimmunotherapy. And uh, in the cooperative group system, the National Clinical Trials Network in the United States, we're designing studies that will begin to do this. And hopefully in the next five to 10 years, for at least our common lymphomas, like follicular lymphoma and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, rather than treating everybody the same, we're going to be smarter at the way we allocate these treatments for the benefit of patients. So today we don't have good predictors on who's most likely to respond to these oral treatments uh, and who maybe gets the most benefit from these oral treatments over more conventional agents. But there are a lot of studies going on looking at genome uh, sequencing approaches, looking at gene expression analyses approaches, and looking at relevant subsets of patients that I think will likely bear fruit over the next few years. The increased use of oral agents is indicative of a trend that we've seen in oncology, where the combination of more targeted therapy and ultimately a precision approach where we're assigning therapies to patients have resulted not only in superior outcomes, but a much better tolerability. And the image that patients and their families have of somebody suffering through chemotherapy 
is really not an accurate image anymore in the lymphoma space. Even when we give chemotherapy, we're able to make it well tolerated for most patients. And with these oral agents, I think it's really been a big shift on increasing tolerability and allowing patients to do well for long periods of time. I think there are a number of tools that are under development and that have been developed. Uh, and I think that the number one tool has to be a good relationship and understanding with the physician and the, and the uh, medical team. Uh, in order to understand how to be compliant with this treatment and understand what the side effects, there has to be the same degree of attention paid when a physician writes a prescription as when a physician writes for IV chemotherapy. And that's a mindset that I think all of us physicians need to have. In addition, fortunately, both the sponsors of these drugs as well as uh, resources such as the Lymphoma Research Foundation's mobile app are really good resources for patients to try to um, maximize their compliance and understand more about what to expect when taking these medications. As we have a national conversation about cost of these oral agents and ensuring that patients who need them have access to them, Many organizations, such as LRF, have played instrumental roles in moving this conversation forward. And the advocacy component of LRF has been very valuable, and I encourage people to look on the website to understand what LRF is doing and help LRFs in their um, move to make this happen.